Celebrating 20 years of Dragon's Lair. You'll go behind the scenes and hear the true story of the making of Dragon's Lair. Meet the creative team behind one of the most successful games in history. In 1983, Dragon's Lair was the first Laserdisc coin-operated video game. This year, Dragon's Lair is going to make history again. It is the first high-definition TV video game ever to be created. The secret of Daphne is revealed. Body came from those photos in, in Playboy magazine. I knew you were going to tell that. <laughs> that was one of the secrets. Yeah, it did. It came from Playboy. Meet the voices behind the characters. <laughs> Get a first look at Dragon's Lair 3D, the groundbreaking game that is about to make history all over again. Dragon's Lair has proven two and three times previously to be an, an amazing winner. This time, with the technology, it's going to go through the ceiling. Welcome to a celebration of 20 years of Dragon's Lair. This is a very dangerous place indeed. It's the giant castle of the evil Mordrock, a powerful dark wizard who is definitely up to no good. You see, the evil dragon Singe has captured the lovable princess Daphne and locked her in a bubble. Please it's up to me. bumbling Dirk the Daring to navigate the many dangers of the castle and save the princess. And there you have it, the basic premise of one of the most enduring video games in history. One of just three to make it all the way to the Smithsonian Institute. Hello, I'm Dave Hood. The story of Dragon's Lair begins when Rick Dyer, Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, and John Pomeroy put their creative forces together, and the result was a game that saved the coin-op industry, and over the next 20 years went on to become a household word. Dragon's Lair made its way to almost all of the major game platforms, to DVD, and even to television. And now, the same team is at it again. Dragon's Lair is about to be reborn. And to think that it all started as a simple idea back in 1982. The original Dragon's Lair was the brainchild of Rick Dyer. The entrepreneur and inventor had the idea to take a new technology, combine it with an animated film, and create an interactive fantasy game called Dragon's Lair. My wife and I went to see this film called The Secret of Nim. And I just love that film. And I just pointed to the screen and I said, Jan, that's, that's who we want to animate Dragon's Lair. The Secret of Nim was the product of Don Bluth Productions in Studio City, California. The former Disney animators had struck out on their own. Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, and John Pomeroy have since gone on to produce more than 11 animated motion pictures. Rick Dyer walked into our office with an idea for a video game based on Laserdisc technology, where we would be able to make a movie-like video game with a branching technique that allowed the player to make certain decisions and watch the continuity and essentially watch a movie. A deal was quickly put together between the Bluth Animation team in Studio City and Dyer's creative team in San Diego. Then began a race against the clock to have a sample ready for the Chicago game show just a few months away. We started in about October, uh, maybe even November of 1982, and uh, we were racing towards a date. I believe the date was March of 1983, which would be the Chicago game show. We were borrowing money from everybody we knew to keep this game alive. We were really doing something that had never been done before because of the introduction of, of a brand new technology at the time called the, the laser disc. And it enabled you to have virtually instantaneous access to any part of a, of a film or series of video clips and you could put them together uh, not quite seamlessly but almost. Somewhere around the late January we found an investor that would put up the money to actually do the production and get us to the to the Chicago game show. The central character in Dyer's Dragon's Lair is a bumbling knight the team chose to call Dirk the Daring. Creating Dirk was a formidable task. 
The problem that animators have, which is very similar to what actors have, is before they can pick up the pencil and draw a character, either his design or draw him moving, you have to figure out what's going on in his head. So I think the first place you go is to try and find the character. And with Dirk, that's what it was all about. We wanted to find out what's going on inside the guy's head. He has illusions of grandeur. He actually thinks he's greater than he really is. That's what makes him funny. Uh, He'll tackle something that seems absolutely overwhelmingly impossible because he doesn't get that it's impossible. Jerk to me represents the bumbler. You know, the guy who just can't get it right, trips over himself, his feet are too big, his hands are too big. Everything about him says he's not your typical hero. And I kept thinking, how can we make that guy appealing? And the first thing we, we went to, usually when you're creating a character, is the voice. You know, what kind of voice is it going to be? <laughs> and then, Finally, after trying a lot of voices and hearing a lot of people talk, looking at a lot of videos and everything, we said, well, let's don't make him talk. Because the more we put a voice in him, the more he took on a different kind of a spin as a hero. And so we just said, if he really is a bumbler, probably all he can do is yell and scream and, you know, and holler and show pain when he bumps into something. So we just made him pretty much a you know, clumsy guy. And I think that's part of his appeal. <laughs> You know, a, a director's lot is a strange one because what you try and do is uh, entertain an audience and at the same time, at the end of this entertainment, they have learned something that might be edifying to their own life. Uh, and I find that storyboarding is the place where I have enjoyed my career the most. Storyboarding is, is really a director's job because what it is is taking all the little messages, good, bad, scary, whatever they might be, and giving them to the audience at a certain rate of speed or in a certain order so that the audience goes through an emotional experience. And as you follow the, um, the escapades or the journey of the hero through a story, it evokes some kind of an emotion in each of us who are the viewers. And the director's job, which has generally been my lot in life, the director's job is to make sure that the audience goes through this journey and has this emotional reaction. I think with Dirk, I, I really originally expected nothing to happen, but I found that it's probably been one of the most influential characters that we've created. Dan Molina, who is the original editor of the game, became the voice of Dirk. They didn't have any funds to hire any real talent, so they hired me. And uh, I was the editor on the film. And I would throw in, I would cut in my little screams and grunts and groans and <gasps> sounds. Um, and it stuck. Creating the beautiful Daphne, Dirk's love interest, was a challenge even for a veteran animator like Don Bluth. My wife had asked me to move all of the, the Playboys out of the house, and I had about That's a, a five-year collection of Playboys. And I'd stored them up in the attic of the studio, you know, and they were just stacked up. I mean, they had five years worth of 60 Playboys. And uh, Don was down there and he says, you know, I've got to find some poses to put, to put this Daphne in and give her that look, because, I mean, we've all agreed she's going to be uh, kind of a Marilyn Monroe type. He says, don't you have, didn't you, didn't you bring those Playboys into the studio? And I said, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, what if we look through there? There might be some poses in there. So I brought down, and it was a very funny image seeing Don in here, you know, uh, the king of animation design with these stacks of Playboys and rummaging, rummaging I through them. That was a great assignment. To, I enjoyed it. I it try, so cool. Trying to find these very, you know, sexy poses that put different you know, you, know, you don't have to turn too many pages in a Playboy to find sexy poses. <laughs> I mean, that just works out just fine. <laughs> and every artist goes through this. You get to the you get to the point on the women where you're drawing the breasts, okay? And then you, you get to that place on the breast where the nipple is, and you say, well, do I draw this or do I play like it doesn't exist? And so well, I said, well, it's there. Why not draw it? <laughs> oh, so yeah. I drew it, and um, it seems to be the thing that the young kids like to draw. Oh. Now with the Chicago Game Show just weeks away, the race was on. So we race like mad. I mean, if you understand animation, you, you can't do animation fast, especially if you're going to do it well. And uh, we had a small crew, and we were able to put together, I think, about five 
what we would call rooms that the uh, player could go through. And Rick and uh, the people at Cinematronics took the, this small portion of the game to Chicago and it became the hit of that game show. But it wasn't at all what I expected. Uh, we didn't think the game would be anything but just, you know, maybe successful. But it was more than just successful. It was very, very big. Dragon Slayer was not only the hit of the Chicago show, the game sold 32 million in arcade units and took in over $100 million in quarters in 1983. In fact, it proved to be the savior of the $9 billion a year coin-op industry, bringing hundreds of thousands of new customers to the arcades to see this incredible game. The new LaserDisc technology made possible the huge leap forward from the stick-like figures of Pac-Man to the high movie quality animation of Dragon's Lair. Now the life cycle of most games is six months to a year, so for a game to still be going strong after almost 20 years is unheard of. Dragon's Lair became a phenomenon, and to toy with a concept this successful is dangerous business. So Dyer and his team waited until the time was just right and the technology could rise to the task of reinventing the game, this time in 3D, this time with the sound of a 70-piece orchestra, and this time the player would actually control all of Dirk's movements in real time. It recently made its debut at the E3 convention in Los Angeles where thousands had the opportunity to see and play the new Dragon's Lair 3D. Don, Gary, John, and myself, we were reluctant to do a 3D version of Dragon's Lair because we were so protective of Dirk and Daphne and the characters, and it really wasn't until this year that we could truly make the characters real and give you the control of, of Dirk and, uh, and, and be able to, to make him do all the things that you've always dreamed of. interesting when Rick came out to uh, Phoenix to visit us at uh, the studio he introduced the idea of remaking or reviving Dragon's Lair even though it had been continuing to sell as DVD he said we can pull this together and make a brand new game by making it digital doing a CGI version of it. Yeah but you know what I thought was interesting he said why should we be doing this I mean the other one's there why what's why is it going to be better uh, and I think the better where I got convinced where he said because you'll have control of Dirk. It'll be not only just 3D, which we're all used to doing in the movies, he said, but you'll get to make that guy do the jumps, the rolls, the dives, the walks, everything. He said, that's different. And we try to remain faithful to the integrity the way it looked before but it's been enhanced and beefed up the way the characters move uh, the way they turn corners the way they'll battle all of this action has been heightened quite a bit with the technology that's available to us now it wasn't available to us 20 years ago uh, being faithful to the personalities was important because there's a whole uh, generation of game players that remember the dragon's lair but in today's marketplace, you have to be much more exciting, much more daring. So we want to get them involved in a virtual adventure. Take them through the maze, throw them in the pit, feel the fire. Everything is not just seen, also but felt. I mean, it's a all-encompassing battle that they get wrapped up into. Much more adventurous, much more involved in the original game of 20 years ago. So we're very grateful for the technology. We're very grateful for the people who have come to us, Rick with all of his technicians and how they have plussed all of the action and made it incredibly, incredibly real. When we were making the original Dragon's Lair movie, we had hoped so much that perhaps this would open a door to what I call a uh, interactive movie, not just what we would call a game. And as I was sitting here today, you know, looking at some of the, the outtakes and some of the things that are in the actual Dragon's Lair 3D, I kept thinking, you know what, this is as close to an interactive movie as we can get. The score, the sound effects, 
the drama and you participating in it, you're interacting or causing this movie to move forward and you literally become the protagonist or the hero that's going on a journey. So I think this is a great step forward just in the name of entertainment. To meet the challenge of creating Dragon's Lair in 3D, a company called Dragon Stone was created, where the very best talent in the business was brought together to rise to the task of realizing the original arcade cartoon look of the game in polygon form. Now, their biggest challenge was to bring the original cartoon look from the Bluth team to the now more than 240 computer-generated rooms of the castle, and to try to maintain the cartoon, cel-shaded look that was so important to the look of the characters. Well, what I do is, um, first of all, I, I have to make sure that our game matches the original game. Um, I model the characters, like Daphne here, I modeled her. Um, then what I do is, after modeling her, I place all the, the texture maps on her. Um, because without the texture map, she just looks like, you know, a solid, solid mass. 240 rooms, 40 characters, all artificially created in a fantasy world. It's taken four years of hard work and innovation to make it real. Anything less was not acceptable. Spirit of the, the environment itself, the castle, many of the same paintings that we had in the original Dragon's Art game were all scanned into the computer and mapped all over the walls of the castle and everything. So he has taken those and they have built on that. We do have new rooms that we don't have references for because they're brand new, so we'd have to come up with something very similar. So my job is at some point give the artists and the level mappers something to go on. Very proud of the fact that Dragon's Earth 3D will be the first game simultaneously released on all of the major platforms, the GameCube, Xbox, PlayStation 2, PC, and Macintosh, and also the first high-definition game ever released. On HDTV, you have literally the resolution of film, and uh, the new Dragon's Lair is uh, 1,080 lines by 1,920 lines. So that's 1,080 lines high by 1,920 lines long and that's an, just an unbelievable resolution. The Dragonstone team also pioneered a technique called motion blending to give Dirk the ability to move in true 3D. And that's, that's a process to seamlessly uh, blend the character's physical movements uh, so that, that they look natural. As Dirk runs around in the game, he has a library of 16 different animations that he can switch between or actually blend between at any given time in order to create uh, a particular animation that he needs to play for some purpose. So what we've done is we've taken this forward movement animation and done a continuous blend with a very similar animation where Dirk actually runs sideways. So you can see uh, this is the full sideways animation and then by doing a continuous blend, we're actually able to take part of the forward animation and part of the sideways animation and play them together, and he can actually run diagonally. But I, I notice that when I look at the game, the new 3D game, that it's pushed even farther. The colors and the effects and all the moving sparks and the shadows and everything are all amplified far beyond what we did in the original. So there's something great there. There's another thing artistically which, uh, which I suggested to Gary one day. I said, Gary, you know what, if this is to be a real experience for those who watch it, they need the power of music and they need the power of sound effects. And right now what we're looking at, it's in the early stages and it appears to just be like watching you know, a film that hasn't yet gone to be scored. I said, what we really need to do is find Chris Stone again and bring him back into the picture and say, Chris, write us a score for this game. So it's like a movie. And uh, so Chris has gone in and written something which is very much like a big, very powerful movie score. Uh, it's a little more sophisticated. So what I wanted to do is really capture the gist of what I was, what I was tr trying to do 20 years ago and actually make it work 20 years later. 
creates a sense of danger, like it tries to suck you into the game more, like you're there, like you're and identifying with the character more, so that, you know, when he's in danger, you're feeling the dangerous sense of it, or, you know, when there's a mystical moment, you're experiencing the mystical. It's just, it's just to add uh, more realism to it, really, even though there's no music in real life going on behind real life, but somehow it, it helps in the fantasy process. about a 70, 80 piece orchestra in the real world, probably. To match the original, Darcy Harvey R. was chosen to be the new voice of Daphne. I just worked downstairs from these guys, and he was looking for someone who sounded young, and so he just thought of me and introduced me, and next thing you know, <laughs> I'm Daphne. To slay the dragon, use the magic sword. Next order of business, coming up with a catchy theme song everyone would like. Julie Eisenhower was chosen to sing. I hate to tell you, but I know it would be perfect. And I, all of you are, you're just going to go to the ceiling. No, maybe not. Let's try it. <laughs> rap. Rap? Rap. R-A-P. A oh, rap. Rap, yes. See, I, it's not even well, a word wait, wait, that wait, flows off your, It's not even a word that flows off your tongue. Hang on, I'm processing. <laughs> you're pro yes. what, 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 what if you rap to get it into it, and then there's some place, I'd be a bridge or something, where it took off and right. went into ballot? Exactly. And back it went into back the in. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. You'll just do it differently. Yeah. Put an attitude in here is that you and Dirk in bed are really, really fun. So you if like, you've got it in your experience and you've got a guy like that and something's going on, <laughs> put it in the sounds you're making. I'll try. Okay. So, so you wanna just run should we just run through? Sure. Pick up with a dragon, what a four. Been there, seen that, done it before. Who talk a dragon that you were exact? Can we get a bubble? What's up with that? I want it out, but there's no way. Then came my night to save the day. Dragon's Lair 3D Return to the Lair is not just a remake of a great game, but a rebirth in full motion 3D. The original game had 40 rooms to explore. The new game, more than 240 rooms, with close to 40 characters to battle, and 20 of those are brand new. There are hidden secrets and special surprises all the way through the game. And all of this takes place with the backdrop of beautiful hand-painted cell-shaded graphics and original art inspired by Don Bluth. The new game is a faithful tribute to the old, with enough new surprises to satisfy even the toughest critic. Dragon's Lair 3D is much more than just a video game. It's entertainment, it's a movie, it's a game, and a musical score all rolled into one big adventure that you get to control. It's the first game to successfully bring together the look, feel, and sound of a feature film with the excitement and personal control of a challenging game. And I've even heard a rumor that there may be a movie in the works. Oh, no one's supposed to know that. Yeah, you know, uh, we're working on, we're in pre-production right now on that, and we've got a script after about a year working on that, but uh, we're trying to get all the pictures and all the visions and the sets worked out right now, so we'll, we'll tell you more about it later. I can't wait. So to Rick Dyer, Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, John Pomeroy, and the entire creative team at Dragonstone, thanks for 20 years of fun, and we're all looking forward to 20 years more. So happy anniversary, Dragon's Lair, and thanks for watching. Thank you.